2 Corinthians chapter 7, that's our reading for today. You know, so much of, of what we've read so far in regards to these brethren at Corinth, well, it's just, it's been negative. And as we'll read this morning, um, it wasn't easy for Paul to confront his brethren, to write a hard letter, but it was necessary. And what we're going to see in our reading this morning, the Corinthians, they responded in the right way, um, certainly bringing much comfort um, to Paul. And I'm reminded as I read this this morning that repentance is hard. Repentance is change. It's a change of mind um, that leads to a change of conduct. And this chapter presents a beautiful example of really, I'll call it zealous repentance or passionate um, repentance. And it's a wonderful model um, for us, the sinner, when we are confronted um, with sin in our lives, whether it be by a good brother or sister who loves us, enough to help us in that, or possibly just as we're studying God's Word, as we're confronted with the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, let's begin at verse 1. We'll read down to verse 16. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Make room for us in your hearts. We've wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. I do not speak to condemn you, for I have said before that you were in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I'm filled with comfort. I'm overflowing with joy in all our affliction. For even when we came to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort which in, with which he was comforted in you, as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a little while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance, for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Verse 11 says, For behold, what earnestness this very thing is, that godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong, and everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it is not for the sake of the offender, nor for the sake of the one offended, but that your earnestness on our behalf might be known to you in the sight of God. For this reason, we've been comforted. Besides our comfort, we rejoiced even much more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I was not put to shame. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, so also our boasting before Titus proved to be in truth. His affection abounds all the more toward you as he remembers the obedience of you all. You received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice that in everything, he says, I have confidence in you. What a beautiful letter. What a beautiful chapter. You know, I want us to focus on verse 10 for just a moment. And let's make this statement before reading it again. Brethren, there is a difference between worldly and godly sorrow. And not only that, there's two different, very different outcomes for that matter. Look at verse 10 again. He says, for the sorrow is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Brother, I want us to appreciate there is sorrow in both of these responses. And just because we're sorrowful, that doesn't mean that we truly repent it. I, I hope we can see that. Just because I say I'm sorry uh, that doesn't mean that I've truly repented. You know, sometimes we say sorry, and then we think, well, it's just uh, the end of it. That gets the people off our back. That's not what we see here. A worldly sorrow is sorry I got caught with little intention to do anything about it, little intention to, to make any significant changes. And we've all experienced this. We, we, we say the right things, maybe put on a little show and attempt to convince the, the people we've heard that we're sorry, but there's no real intention, really, if we're honest, of doing anything about it. We're not really uh, I'm not willing to change. You know, godly sorrow, those all together, different. Um, a godly sorry and sorrow produced by the will of God, it produces in us an earnest desire to do something about the wrong we've committed. It's not shrugging it off. It's not indifference to it. We recognize the magnitude of what we've done, and we want to change. We, we, we want to make it right. You know, for our time this morning, I don't want to take the time to define all the phrases that Paul uses by way of describing true repentance and, and praising these Corinthians for really the, just their, their vehement desire to make this right, uh, to change. But I just want you to listen to it again. I want you to look at verse 11 again. He says, for behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong, and everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. 
you, you see in this the desire for this to be made right, to be right. There's a desire for change. But brother, let's confront ourselves for a moment as we, as we close the week out. You know, Paul here, he, he wrote a hard letter. He confronted these brethren with the sin in their lives. And Paul talks about the difficulty here of doing such. And it is hard, isn't it? Uh, let me ask you this. How do you respond when you're confronted with wrongs in your life? Are you humble? Are you willing to listen? Are you honest enough with yourself to admit uh, that you're wrong? And then what? When, when God's word convicts you of sin in your life, what's your response? Is it is it godly sorrow leading to salvation, or is it, sorry, I got caught? Is it worldly sorrow leading to death? Does anything ever really change? Or is it just a quick, I'm sorry, and then move on, but nothing really changes? You know, brethren, change is hard, but it's necessary. You know, as sinners, there, there's times when things are not right. Surely you're humble enough to admit that. And brethren, if we're fortunate enough to have a Paul in our lives that's willing to to bring that to our attention, be thankful and be humble enough to change, to truly repent, desire to make it right, change your mind, change your actions of moving forward. You know, in this instance, this morning, the Corinthians, that are certainly worthy of our invitation. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Father, we're so thankful for your word, for the power it has to, to change our hearts, Father. Help us as we study, Father. Help us to be humble. Help us to study it with a mind to to make corrections, to change. Father, when we discover that there's wrongs in our life, Father, help us to be humble enough and courageous enough to admit that we're wrong, but be willing to, to desire and, and passionately desire even, Father, to, to make those things right, to change, to change our minds, to change our lives, our behavior. And Father, we're thankful that you are willing to forgive us when we have wronged you. We have wronged others. For that grace and mercy, Father, we are so very thankful. And we recognize that it's through the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that all of this is possible. Father, apart from it, we, we would be sinners destined for hell. And your love, Father, we're so thankful. Father, we're thankful that our, our sister Judy yesterday, that her procedure went well. We're thankful for good results. And Father, we continue to pray as we await more results. We're also thankful, Father, that Sister Jenny's biopsy um, she was able to get through it. And as she waits for the results, Father, we pray for her. And Father, we continue to pray for our sister Ellie as our prayer and that she'll be able to go home today. Things will go well with her. Father, for her um, courage through this, for her good spirit, her good attitude, we're thankful for Brandon and his love for her and the girls caring for them through this. We're thankful, Father. Bless that entire family as they've been through so much. Father, bless us um, this coming Lord's Day as we get together and worship you for the opportunity that you've afforded us through this pandemic, Father, we're most thankful. As we transition back into the building, Father, we pray that that will go smoothly, that we'd be united. Um, just be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.